Well, good morning, Lindsley Avenue. Good morning. It's good to see everybody today. We're glad to have some visitors here with us. Again, glad you're here and hope you will come back again any opportunity that you have. Uh, our friends and family at Knowles, we're always thinking and praying about you and glad you were joining us, even if it is a couple of hours later. So glad to have everyone here. It's, glad to, it's good to see the artistic expressions that are up everywhere. And I think a lot of us are looking forward to the activities of the afternoon. So uh, it's an amazing thing, the creative power of God that still dwells within us. Some of us more than others. You don't see anything I drew up there, that's for sure. But uh, glad to have everyone here. I have one question as we start off. Who knows who that is in the picture? I heard it. Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison. And I titled this, the handout, by the way, that you're going to get at the end of the sermon, I want you to take it home. I'm well aware that by 3 o'clock, most of us will say, what did Gene talk about today? If you even remember, I talked about something today. So I try to put it to paper so you might find the paper later and say, oh, yeah, I remember that guy went on and on about that for seemingly hours. You'll get that at the end of service today. But I titled it here, Forget Me, Forget Me Not. You know, Sometimes we play that game, especially seemingly lovelorn ladies or lovelorn men with the daisies, right? She loves me. She really doesn't know who I am. She loves me. You know, that kind of thing. Well, there's a flower called forget-me-not. And so I thought I'd play on the words there, forget me, forget me not, because we're going to talk about forgetfulness today, forgetfulness, and how many times we look at that as a bad thing. I think we need to do more of it. I think we need to be more forgetful than perhaps we are. The inventor of the light bulb, Thomas Edison, did not have an easy time. <clears throat> he tried different bulbs apparently over 900 times before he finally made one that worked. You know, my first one might have been putting a piece of paper between two electrodes, and that would be light for just a brief moment. That would be failure number one, failure number two. 900 times before he got one that worked. Think about that for a minute. He failed a lot, right? Failed a lot until he got one that worked. 900 times he went to the trouble of making some sort of light bulb, plugging the thing in, flipping the switch, and either nothing happened or it went and disappeared. People must have thought he was nuts, but he kept trying. According to Edison, every time he made a light bulb that didn't work, he merely found one additional way not to make a light bulb. And I think that's probably what kept him going. He did not focus on the past and his failures. If he had, he would have given up. 900 times he failed. You ever tried something 900 times and kept failing and got up the next morning and tried again? I suspect most of us have not. But eventually, when he kept trying, he succeeded. If he had focused on his failures, he would have quit. But he didn't. Have you ever noticed how some people tend to get stuck in the past? They just can't let go of something. They get stuck in the past. Some people have a high point in their life and they don't want to move on. You know, in high school, right, I scored three touchdowns in one game, you know, when they're 93 years old, right? Nothing in the rest of their life matters other than that brief moment in high school when I was the queen of the prom or something to that effect. High points tend to obscure the rest of our life. It's nice to have a high point, right? We all want to be cheered at some time or other. But some people also continue to dwell on a past mistake they've made or a previous sin to bring it more into a church setting, more religious setting, a previous sin, some mistake they made that they just can't seem to forgive themselves about. Sometimes as well, people get caught up in somebody else's past and won't let that go either. You know, if you remembered something he did, and you can see I'm pointing at you, if he did something, you know, on the evening of October the 7th, 2014, you said this, right? And nothing he's ever going to be able to do will, will get rid of that memory. You can't hold on to things people have done. We all make mistakes. We don't want a ledger. It's easier when it was paperless. You could always sneak and find the paper and tear it up or burn it. Now you keep logs in the cloud, and so they never go away. We need to let go of the mistakes that we have made and not focus on the mistakes other people make. I always remember that statement, right? The person who is without sin should cast the first stone. We all make mistakes. 
We all make mistakes. At the same time, it's really strange. We do forget some things pretty easily. We do. We forget some things really easily. How many of us have ever done this? Why did I come into this room? And yeah, you young people, go ahead and laugh. Right? I want to see you all in 60 years and see if that hasn't happened to you by now. Or how about this one? Now, where did I put my keys? No, but you're going to get talked about that later. It's going to be added to the list if you look at somebody because they forgot their keys. We forget something so easily, and yet we can't forget other things, right? There are other things that turn out to be very hard to forget, sometimes just failures in various ways. You ever felt like that? Something is a failure, whether a moral failure or a mistake at work, interpersonal relationship mistake, whatever it is, when we're sitting there brooding is the word, right? Brooding on it, thinking about it, dwelling on it. Or from a sports analogy, had that open shot, and what you do, you kicked it into the opponent's bench rather than the goal. Well, I thought about that yesterday. I don't know if any of you were watching college football, but there was a very exciting play at the end of the Oregon-Washington game last night. Oregon was behind three points, and I thought they were, they were doomed. And they got to within field goal range, and they came out with like four or five seconds to go, and this poor young man got out there, and it was wide right. He missed. Now, if he's still thinking about that this morning, this sermon applies to you if you happen to track this down on social media somewhere. Why was he in that position? Is it all his fault? In that case, from sports? No. There was a penalty that set them back and meant they didn't score a touchdown earlier in the game. We always focus on the things that we did when, in fact, it's a bad way to be. It's just a bad way to be. Let me confess personally, I have a problem with this kind of thing. I do. And bringing it up and talking about it today, unfortunately, I'm going to put it right up in here and it won't go away. But I was about, I don't know, 24, 25 years old. Yeah, I know. We, we had TVs back then. We did. Uh, 24, 25 years old. And I was an umpire in Little League Baseball. I don't umpire anymore. Because for these eight and nine year old teams, we were in the semifinals, and we had one umpire for the whole game. So I was behind the plate, crouching, calling the balls and strikes. And when there was a hit, we had to run down with the runner on first base to make the call. And the best team by far in the whole league was playing like a third or fourth place team in the semifinals. And they were ahead. The team that's supposed to win was ahead. And so when I go running down as this guy made a hit for the team that was supposed to lose, I get down there and I call out, safe! And then a step or two later, the batter gets to first base. I said the wrong thing. Why on earth did my brain short circuit and call safe? He was out. He was out. It was obvious he was out. In fact, the, the runner left first base and started going to the bench. And the coach was screaming at him, get back on the base, he called you safe. The opponent coach he was mad. He came all the way across the diamond, screaming at me in my face, and I couldn't think. If I could have said, hey, time out, coaches, you know, if I could have been rational, give me just a moment, what did I say? What did I say? Did I say safe? We all know he was out. Let's go. I could, not with the guy screaming in my face. I told him to get out, right? The team that was supposed to win the whole league championship fell apart. A little ground ball. I mean, I could roll it slow on that little hill and it would still be going faster than the next batter hit the thing. And it went right through the legs of the player for the good team. The runners were going around the bases and scoring. They lost horribly. Uh, almost certainly because of my mistake. The guy running the league found me in the parking lot. What happened out there? He said. The, what, what? What are you talking about? What do you mean what happened? I mean, I'm a young guy. I've made a mistake. If they hadn't been in my face, I would like to think I could have thought through it, but I couldn't up after that. And I still think back about it. Where are those kids now, right? Did they wake up saying, I want to get the umpire? A couple of years
years after that, in an office building, I ran into that coach who had come across. I thought he was going to smack me upside the head. He was still mad when he recognized who I was. I've been this guy before. But those are things that happen in our day-to-day -day lives. Okay, we all have regrets. We all have mistakes that we remember. More importantly is our times where we make mistakes, where we do things we know we shouldn't do. We call them sins, moral failures. We make choices that we knew better that we really shouldn't have done, and we did them anyway. It's not a very healthy way to live, to live in the past and focus on mistakes. I really should forget that Little League game. I hope all the players have forgotten about it. I really do. But for mistakes that I make in my life and my relationship with God, as long as I have turned away from them, as long as I have repented and, and prayed for them, I, I need to let them go. I really do. The Apostle Paul had a very, very rough past. And that's where I really want to focus on today. Because I suspect more so than all of us, he had things in his past that he really wished he had forgotten. And I think he turned away from them pretty well. So I want us to emulate the Apostle Paul. He said here in Philippians 3, 12 through 13, he says, I have not yet reached my goal and I am not perfect, but Jesus has taken hold of me. It's not me, it's Jesus having taken hold of me. So I keep running and struggling to take hold of the prize. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider that I have made it on my own, but one thing I do. What's his secret? What's his secret for continuing to press on? That starting point should be our starting point. Forgetting what lies behind. Forgetting what lies behind. We have to learn to do an Elsa. Let it go. No, I know you were looking forward to Elsa, Max. I mean, we've got to let it go. We were recently around a whole lot of little girls, and this came on, and they all stopped and just broke into song. It, it is the, the, the song of the century, if you will, especially for younger girls. But it's a great idea when it comes to letting things go and not dwelling on things that may hold us back. Do an Elsa. Do an Elsa. We can't change anything in the past anyway. Why do I think about that Little League game? Can I teleport somehow through a time machine back and scream at myself, he's out? No, it doesn't do any good. It doesn't do any good to focus on mistakes I made that were sinful, choices I made that I shouldn't have made if I've already made them. I need to focus on it enough to repent, to uh, turn my life around and not do it again, but can, many times we go back to those things even after we've tried to turn away from them and keep holding on to them. We can't let it go. But what about Paul? Well, I know we've all made mistakes. Everyone in here is a sinner. We've all made choices that looking at is like, why didn't I do that? What about Paul? What were some things he had done that he had to say, forgetting what lies behind, right? That's going to be our motive, our, our focus today, forgetting what lies behind. What did Paul have to forget? Well, at the end of Acts 7, all of Acts 7 is the, the, the deacon, the young man Stephen, who is going through a history of what's happened to the Jewish people, and then he makes a statement, a proclamation about Jesus, and they just, the Jewish leaders just can't take it. And so they stone Stephen to death. That's how Acts 7 ends. They throw rocks at him until he is dead. All right? So in verse 58 through 60 of Acts 7, they cast him, Stephen, out of the city and stoned him. And witnesses laid down their garments. I guess they took off their fancy coats so they could throw the rocks harder. They laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. Now this is who we later come to know as Paul. Saul is his name early and then it becomes Paul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he, Stephen, cried out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. A lot to learn right there. But did you notice who's watching the backpack, so to speak? Who's watching the clothes? Who's, who's taking care of the garments so that everybody can go out and throw a hard rock at Stephen? 
is Saul. It's the Apostle Paul. And the next verse, Saul approved of this execution. They may be watching the coach, but it's as if he's out there picking up a big rock himself. The very first time we encounter him, he's approving, he's encouraging, yeah, get that guy. Get that guy. Kill him. Kill him. And for the first time we meet him, he's involved in the death of a Christian, a follower of Jesus. And there arose, continuing on there next day, there arose on that day, right after Stephen is put to death, there arose on that day, or the days afterward, a great persecution against the church, against the followers of Jesus in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. They were staying in Jerusalem. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation, great weeping, great sorrow was felt for him. But Saul, there he is again. He had been watching the coats when they stoned Stephen to death, but here he is now. What's he doing now? He was ravaging the church. Some translations say laying waste the church and entering house after house and dragging off men and women and committing them to prison. He had tasted it. He had gotten the fire, the fever, when they were putting Stephen to death, and he jumped on board and began looking for more Christians. After all, this was, in his view, a good thing when Stephen was stoned to death for getting rid of that apostate, that person who's not following God the way he should, should be following him the way the Jewish people do. He's talking about this Jesus guy, we've got to snuff that out. And so he goes house to house looking for Christians and committing them to prison. He is laying waste God's family, followers of Jesus. So he got ramped up. Paul had done that too. He then continues in saying here in Philippians 3, 6, a few verses before, he says, as to zeal, as to being in, in, on fire, if you will, for God, he was a persecutor of the church. That's the way he had been. That's in his past. Perhaps that's what came to mind when Paul wrote this, remembering being at the scene when Stephen is stoned to death, going house to house and persecuting God's people being on fire for God by persecuting the followers of Jesus. But over here in 1 Timothy 15, he said, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. Maybe he remembers some of those Christians that died because he came in and drug them out of houses. Maybe he remembers not standing with Stephen, but being happy to see Stephen being put to death. So I suspect... I suspect Paul had to really work hard to leave his past behind him, don't you? If he's anything like me, in the way I'll be going to sleep thinking about that little league game that pops up, it really does. We can think back to mistakes we made that were sinful things, choices we made. It happens to us. It had to have happened to Paul. It had to have happened to Paul. He struggled, but notice what's different about Paul did not consume him. It did not destroy him the way it sure seems to do to some people. He knew who he was. He knew what he had done. But he knew even more importantly what God had done for him. Forgetting what lies behind, which is what we all need to struggle to do, and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal of the prize for the, of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. You see people sometimes running in a sprint, and you can almost see them reaching out to break the tape first. They push their chest out, right? Trying their best to reach to get there. That's what Paul's doing here. He's using the language of a race. i got to forget the fact that maybe I tripped over that first hurdle. I've got to forget what's happened so far. I've got to stretch out. Finish the race and get the prize. And what's the prize? The upward call of God in Christ Jesus. It doesn't matter what's happened before. What matters is what I do right now. What consumed Paul was finishing the race, not the past. Finishing the race, the goal, the future. Each day is new and yesterday ended or like until at midnight. Why am I going to focus on whatever happened yesterday? Until we get a time machine, I really don't have to worry a whole lot about yesterday. Each moment constantly is slipping into the past. 
we would all be in the dark if Edison had focused on his failures. Dark enough in here anyway, right? With clouds outside. If we, if we didn't have lights, what would our world be like today? Fortunately, Edison didn't focus on his failures. He left the failures behind and kept moving forward. Well, more importantly, none of us, none of us need to be in the dark today. There's no reason to stay in the dark today because Jesus brought light to the earth, God's light to illuminate our lives. That light, John says, was the life of man. We need to forget what is behind and come to the Father of lights today. So if you are a member of God's family and you keep focusing on something in the past, if you haven't asked God to forgive you, maybe that's why you keep focusing on something in the past. You can come to God and ask God to forgive you. I, I, I'm so sorry for what I've done. I want to be a better person. God, forgive me. Help me to be more the kind of person you want me to be. And God will take whatever paper, if you will, that that mistake is on. It's gone. It will disappear the moment we turn back to God. If you've already asked for forgiveness, God doesn't know what you're talking about when you come back a second time. We can help you with that. Come and we'll take your name to God in prayer. He will gladly forgive you. If you're not a member of God's family, then all I can really compare it to is somebody that's acting against what God wants. Saul had been in that position. Paul had been in that position. You may not be killing Christians, but God wants you to turn away from the way you have been living for yourself and turn and start following after Jesus. It requires a big change in our lives. It does. We don't need to stay in the dark. So will you come to the light today? As together we stand and sing.